Hey, thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to Lymphoma Research Foundation, as well as the organizers for this meeting, for the opportunity to talk today about uh, relapse Hodgkin lymphoma. My name is Ryan Lynch, and I'm a lymphoma clinician and faculty member at the University of Washington and Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Uh, these are my um, disclosures. And I always like to start my Hodgkin talks with just a little bit of background about classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So this represents about 10% of all lymphomas, uh, which is approximately 8,500 new cases annually in the United States. This is highly curable with frontline therapy. And this typically consists of combination chemotherapy with or without radiation. And in early stage patients, 85 to 90% or more of patients can be cured. And advanced stage patients, approximately 75 to 80% can be cured. The initial presentation generally involves painless lymph nodes, uh, primarily in the chest. Um, uh, and since this is generally a thymic origin cancer, the mediastinum is involved in 70 to 90% of cases. Um, some, pain, some lymph nodes can get so large, eventually they can cause symptoms, uh, even... Uh, um, and so this can lead to fevers, chills, night sweats, unexplained weight loss. Uh, pain can happen if the lymph nodes do press against nerves, uh, but usually it's not uh, like exquisitely tender lymph nodes unless they get really big and press on something. Itching without a rash is common, and many patients uh, present after going to dermatologists for uh, and get a variety of different topical steroids or lotions to help with this. And then alcohol-induced pain is, is pretty rare, but it's very specific for Hodgkin lymphoma, and it's only seen about 10% of cases. So this involves pain in the site of involved lymph nodes upon drinking alcohol. And this can happen pretty quickly, even within minutes of drinking. And most patients I've seen will generally stop drinking alcohol because it's so unpleasant um, uh, to have, and are very pleasantly surprised eventually once they're treated that... Um, that these symptoms go away. And then cough and lightheadedness can be seen primarily due to pressing on uh, various, uh, you know, the trachea or the, the parts of the lung, as well as uh, the superior vena cava, which is, a, which is the blood vessel that brings blood back to the heart. And so the causes of Hodgkin lymphoma is thought to be a defective immune response from an immune cell that originates in the thymus. Um, there's a variety of environmental factors that may be involved as well as familial clustering. Uh, but these are not specific. So it's not 100% people may get it, but may, there are things that may increase the risk of it. And even having uh, an identical twin that have it has it doesn't guarantee that the other will have it, although it is more likely in the other. Um, there may be some link to infectious mono uh, through the Epstein-Barr virus, uh, but the vast majority of individuals are exposed to Epstein-Barr virus by adulthood and don't get lymphoma. So there's uh, likely other factors involved. Um, it's not contagious and it can't be passed to children directly. Although, as I've mentioned, first degree relatives are more likely uh, 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 to develop this, but not by much more though. The Hodgkin reed stem cell is the malignant cell. So that's the actual cancer cell in these lymph nodes, but it's very rare within a, even a large mass. Uh, most of these tumors are actually uh, regular immune cells that are, have a defective response to this malignant Hodgkin cell. And in the, the picture on the left, there is this, uh, what we call binucleated Hodgkin reed Sternberg cell and surrounded by a variety of, of normal immune cells. On the right, um, in this, this we call low power view, these pink bands around are what we call sclerosis, essentially bands of scar tissue that are around it. And so this can lead to um, delays in diagnosis, particularly in those who have a needle diagnose, uh, needle biopsy. Uh, if the needle primarily gets some of the scar tissue, it may be inadequate to find the hodgkin reed sternberg cells and make a diagnosis. Um, there is a, there's different peaks of Hodgkin lymphoma based on age. There's one peak in adolescent and young adulthood, and then there's an older adult peak. Um, the older adult peak um, uh, recurs uh, when virtually all cancers start increasing in incidence, but the younger peak uh, is certainly of note uh, as well. Um, and then uh, just sort of learning from the past, I, th I think it's always important to talk about how Hodgkin lymphoma used to be addressed and treated and just to give context to how treatments had evolved down the line, uh, and then how studies now are trying to improve upon uh, the limitations of those earlier treatments. 
So this was first described in the 1820s as Hodgkin's disease, which is in essence a fatal condition, um, not even thought to be cancer. You know, they looked at it under a microscope and didn't see actual things that resembled cancer uh, that can be seen in other organs. So they called it Hodgkin's disease. And patients um, over the span of years, three to five years, would eventually get larger and larger lymph nodes, more and more symptoms, kind of just waste away and eventually die of, of their cancer. But some of the first early stage or stage one or two patients were cured with radiation therapy at Stanford in the 1960s. And then uh, eventually development of chemotherapy regimens that can cure many advanced patients. And so a regimen called MOP uh, was one of the first uh, very potent regimens that could cure patients. Uh, and just sort of illustrating some of the toxicities of this, the M actually stands for mustard as in nitrogen mustard. That's the same that was used in mustard gas in, uh, in World War I in the trenches. And in essence, uh, they used that in, in very fixed doses to try to reduce the toxicity of it that was seen, of course, in chemical warfare. Uh, but longer term toxicities were seen both in those patients as well as some of these Hodgkin patients. And it became very clear in the years after this that many patients were dying not of their cancer itself, but of something else. But some of the earliest oncologists, um, because of how uniformly fatal Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin lymphoma was at that time, still found these a success. And so there was, a, to paraphrase uh, some of the oncologists, basically all of whom are now retired who treated patients in this era, if they don't die from lymphoma, it's a success. And so this is just a review of just a, a rough chart of some of those early patients who were treated for uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, about a little over 10% of patients may relapse after the primary therapy. Uh, and most relapses occur within the first few years. And certainly there's very few relapses after five years. But over time, as you go decades later, the rate of second cancers illustrated by that blue line, as well as cardiovascular events illustrated by the gold line, uh, continues to go up and it never really stops. Uh, and so uh, patients who are treated in that era, many whom may live 10, 20, 30 years after treatment, but may succumb to their second or third or fourth cancer or lung complications or heart disease. So in the modern era, a lot of this has been balancing efficacy and toxicity. And there have been uh, ways to improve uh, our a tailoring of treatments. And so, for example, PET scans allowed us to better stage patients. So some of those earliest Hodgkin lymphoma patients, in essence, were overtreated because the consequences of not getting it all was relapse disease and death. So that a, there was an erring towards overtreatment. Uh, but PET scans allow us to more accurately stage patients, know for sure if they're stage one, two, three, or four, know for sure what needs to be radiated and what doesn't. And then finally, the development of antibody-based targeted therapy has really revolutionized the treatment and management of Hodgkin lymphoma. And that sort of brings us to um, the talking about relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma and certainly putting some of these newer drugs in context and talking about how we manage uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma in the setting, as well as some uh, uh, look towards the future and where things may be going. So I just want to talk about the, the FDA-approved drugs, and there's three uh, drugs that have been FDA-approved in the past decade or, or a little over a decade now um, that are antibody-based therapies. And one of the mo uh, most commonly used is a drug called brentuximab vidotin. And in essence, uh, this acts like a Trojan horse drug. Um, and uh, the, the, the term that we use for it is actually called an antibody drug conjugate. So this antibody is designed to target a protein called CD30, which is uniformly expressed on all classical Hodgkin malignant cells. And so this antibody targets that, but attached to this antibody is a, is a neuro, is a, essentially a microtubule toxin that uh, gets taken into the cell and sort of tricks the cell into taking it in. And then this toxin can concentrate within that, that targeted cell and prevent it from uh, replicating itself and growing and eventually leading to cell death. And uh, this is a way to concentrate that uh, microtubule toxin because if this microtubule toxin was just given alone, to give it at doses that might actually kill cancer cells would certainly cause significant side effects. So it's not that the, the drug doesn't get free and cause side effects, it just it hopefully minimizes them by concentrating it within the cancer cell. And so the side effects are often related to this. So neuropathy is probably... Uh, the limiting side effect of this treatment. So 
the longer you take it, the more likely you are to get it. Uh, and so, and it also is an age related relationship. So it takes longer for younger patients to develop the neuropathy than for older patients. It can also lead to low blood counts, particularly when it's combined with chemotherapy. Uh, and then, so that can also lead to fatigue and infection. And so these are some of the most common side effects seen. And there've been several FDA approvals for brentuximab bedotin. So I'm gonna focus more on relapse Hodgkin lymphoma today, but it is approved for untreated uh, advanced stage or stage three or four classical Hodgkin lymphoma in combination with chemotherapy. Uh, it's approved for after auto transplant or after two prior therapies. And then it's also approved as maintenance therapy in high risk patients after auto transplant. There's also another setting where it's very commonly used, although without a specific FDA label. Uh, it can be used for relapse patients by itself or in combination with chemotherapy. And so, as I mentioned, this isn't an official label, but there's been many studies in this setting uh, demonstrating the efficacy of these regimens. And so it has been integrated into the guidelines uh, and, and is generally covered by insurance because of that. So this, you know, North American Education Forum is, you know, it has covered a variety of different topics and immunotherapy uh, can be, it can refer to several different things depending on the context within lymphomas. But what does immunotherapy mean for Hodgkin lymphoma? And so the broadest term for this is in essence, trying to stimulate, stimulate one's own immune system to fight the cancer. And so uh, there are several that have been approved for Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, there's others that are in development that use this general strategy. So one of the hallmarks of Hodgkin lymphoma is that uh, the malignant cells themselves, they should be perceived as foreign by our immune systems and destroyed. So I you know, mentioned that big tumor and our immune system gets in there. Uh, but it's unable or uh, to, to kill all these cells. And so there's a variety of different mechanisms uh, by which these lymphomas can evade the immune system. And the most common one is this pathway called the PDL1, PD1 pathway. And so these, in essence, allow the lymphoma cells to hide in plain sight. And so I sort of just like the analogy of Obi-Wan Kenobi just telling them to move along. And so in essence, you know, if Obi-Wan Kenobi is the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, tell the stormtroopers to move along. Uh, that's in essence what this, uh, what the Hodgkin cell is doing to the immune system, unless there's something to kind of break that force that the cancer has over it. And so this is just a diagram illustrating a little bit more um, uh, of, of that tumor and what it looks like and um, what's around it instead of that pathology image I showed. So on the right is that is a cartoon of this malignant cell called the Reed Sternberg cell. And around it are a variety of different types of immune cells. So there's plasma cells and lymphocytes, specifically T cells that are in there, eosinophils. And so they're all surrounding this. So, you know, they know there's something wrong. There's chemicals that the that the cancer cells are releasing that are causing it to to know something is wrong. But it's not being eliminated. And maybe there are, you know, this happens many times in patients and in those who don't develop Hodgkin, this gets killed before anybody ever knows about it. But in those who develop overt Hodgkin lymphoma, this ineffective immune response is a hallmark. And so sort of use how these immune therapy agents can address this. So on the left here on this cartoon on the purple cell is in essence the cancer cell. And so it can overexpress a protein called PDL1, which in essence is a way for our own cells to protect themselves from the immune system. It's almost like a, it's like a safe word that, okay, immune cell, don't kill me, I'm good. Um, and so when it does this, the immune cell, even if it suspects something's wrong, is essentially disarmed and uh, can't do anything about it. And uh, these two FDA approved drugs are pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And so these can help overcome this immune evasion. And so when uh, on the right here, it just says nivolumab, there's no reason to think that one is necessarily better than the other. They've never been tested head to head, uh, but this diagram uses nivolumab. So in essence, blocks that relationship. So the immune cell uh, doesn't get disarmed. And so this T cell is, is reactivated and can be more active uh, in killing this cancer cell. And this is a sort of oversimplification, but of course, but sort of illustrates how uh, roughly how this mechanism works at reactivating the immune system, allowing it to, in essence, to block that force that allows the cancer cell to hide from the immune system.
And these are very highly effective uh, treatments. Uh, both of these drugs, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, are very common in the uh, solid tumor world. Uh, so they're approved for, uh, I can't even keep track of how many different types of indications they have now, several dozen. Uh, uh, but in Hodgkin lymphoma, it's the most effective, meaning more patients will have disease shrinkage, more patients will go into a complete remission with this than any other type of cancer. And so the approvals are, are, are based mostly on how the initial studies were designed. I'm not even sure insurance companies distinguish between this too much anymore. Uh, it's just, I think people can pick one over the other. Uh, nivolumab has a little bit more specific um, uh, approval based on the prior treatment. So relapse uh, after an auto transplant or, or more line or three more lines of prior systemic therapy. And that, but pembrolizumab has a, as a more a broad label uh, and that has to do with a study where it was able to get approval for second line and patients who are not eligible for a transplant. And so, uh, and both these are proved. Um, they each have dosing that's very favorable. Uh, pembrolizumab uh, in recent years has changed their dosing uh, to every six weeks. Uh, so it's extremely convenient. And nivolumab has every four week dosing. It used to be every, uh, every three and two weeks. Uh, so uh, these drugs do stay in the body for a long time. And there it doesn't appear to be a dose dependent effect, meaning um, uh, patients can get a fixed dose and have similar efficacy. So it doesn't have to be weight or height-based dosing. Uh, the fixed dosing in essence acts like a light switch. It's either there or not there. And it's not clear that giving too much extra makes it any more toxic or any more effective. So I think the big question that you know, patients ask uh, when they come in and that you know they, they're told by their initial oncologist, you have a high chance of being cured, they go through the treatment it comes back and it's very it's very deflating to have a cancer with such a high success rate and then the patient comes in and they're in that small percentage that where the treatment doesn't work so the the first question that i always address even if they don't ask it is you know is this still curable in this setting and so really can Hodgkin, relapse Hodgkin patients still be cured um the short answer is yes, relapse Hodgkin lymphoma patients can be cured. And so I just created this sort of flow sheet. This is very general flow sheet uh, looking at a patient with relapse Hodgkin lymphoma. So patients who are under age 65 or select fit patients between 65 and 75 can undergo curative intent treatment, generally with um, a, sec a salvage chemotherapy regimen. I'll go through what that means uh, on the next slide then they can receive something called an autologous transplant. And then they may receive something called brentuximab maintenance. So that's the drug I discussed before, maintenance. And there's a variety of different reasons somebody might be eligible for that. However, patients who relapse and have either significant medical comorbidities, heart failure, or just older, uh, you know, they're certainly not eligible for transplant. They may be pretty healthy, but they're just older. And generally patients age 75 and older um, are unless somebody is extraordinarily fit or, or, or not generally considered auto transplant candidates, um, or if patients relapse after that auto transplant, we use the term palliative treatments. And in essence, what that means is at least in 2022, with many asterisks and caveats, we wouldn't think that the treatment is able to get rid of every cancer cell forever. Uh, but patients do can have successful treatments in that setting. I'll go through what that means and what uh, how to define success and how long that can last. So going to the patients who are uh, potentially um, curable with uh, for second line therapy, we use this term salvage chemotherapy. And so generally, historically, this had been chemo combinations alone. So sort of more toxic chemo regimens for shorter periods of time. Uh, so it's not that, that uh, these regimens couldn't cure patients in the first line setting, but most patients can be cured with less toxic regimens. So we reserve the more potent toxic regimens for uh, prior to transplant for shorter durations. And so uh, in terms of the alphabet soup here, three, so three of the most common regimens, one's called ICE, another is called DHAP, another is called uh, uh, GND. Um, more recently, there have been many studies looking at brentuximab-based combinations. So that some of the similar regimens combined with brentuximab, so that antibody-based treatment with chemo, uh, or uh, chemo regimens plus immune therapy. And so those have actually even more recently been published by a variety of different centers. 
And uh, there, there's definitely data looking back that suggests that the depth of response can predict the success of the subsequent transplant. So the goal of this second therapy is to have a brisk and deep response. So hopefully even within six to 12 weeks, patients that either achieve a complete remission for the first time or go back into a complete remission. And so those patients um, tend to do better uh, or have a higher chance of cure. And the reason for that is the, the, the way that the transplant works is it's, it's, it's essentially a high dose of chemo to try to get rid of every last cancer cell. So certainly if somebody does very well with the less intensive chemo, they may do even better or get rid of those final cancer cells with the transplant. And so the, uh, the, it can be a little bit confusing because people think the transplant's the treatment. The transplant's actually the rescue. Uh, what can cure patients with Hodgkin lymphoma uh, is the high-dose chemotherapy that's given before it. And so there's usually a regimen called BEAM that's very common before this. So it's a very intense regimen. And if somebody received BEAM without a transplant, it would in essence be a fatal treatment. The, the patients would go into what we call bone marrow failure, all they wouldn't make any more blood cells and eventually would die of a complication of that. Of course, we would never give that regimen without having those stem cells stored and ready. So how this works is the patients get, have their stem cells collected ahead of time, usually through their peripheral blood. Bone marrow harvests are very, very, very rare in adult patient populations. Usually we can do peripheral blood. It's much easier. And then once they're stored away and we know there's adequate stem cells, a time can be set up to receive that high dose chemo and then once the chemo is cleared the body, give those stem cells back actually through, through the peripheral blood. So almost like a blood transfusion, uh, but with, uh, you know, with tan colored cells instead of red colored cells. And uh, it takes several weeks for those stem cells to find their way back into the bone marrow, grow and start producing the white blood cells, the red cells and the platelets again. And, uh, and this can be uh, curative in a, in a good chunk of patients. And so the question that's it's asked is, well, how successful are, is this high-dose chemotherapy uh, followed by uh, autotransplant? And I think this varies quite a bit. So um, there are baseline risk factors. Uh, so how well did the second-line therapy work? Did someone go into a complete remission very quickly? Um, did somebody need more than one type of regimen to get there? Um, did a patient have an early relapse after their initial therapy or did somebody uh, or was somebody in remission for two, three, four years before they relapsed and maybe might be much more sensitive to chemo? If somebody's used brentuximab before, certainly um, having a brentuximab-based salvage regimen may not be as effective. That's not something that was tested in some of these clinical trials, but makes sense that uh, it may not be as effective if somebody got it before. Uh, and the same thing with immune therapy. If somebody's had immune therapy before, they may not respond as well to immune therapy-based salvage regimens. And I think the challenge right now is that there's a lot of phase two studies of various salvage regimens. We've done our own here uh, with BV ice. Um, there's national study of brentuximab plus nivolumab, another one of brentuximab and bendamustine. Uh, there was a Sloan Kettering study looking at pembrolizumab plus GND. There was a City of Hope study and nivolumab plus ice. They've never been compared head to head against each other. So, you know, a lot of these comparisons about how many people can be cured have the limitations of the types of patients that go on the study. So there's a lot of caveats in, in comparing across studies because there could be uh, lower risk patients that go on certain studies and higher risk that go on other, and you can't see that necessarily on paper. So there are some caveats. I would say roughly um, based on historic data uh, with the non-novel agent regimens, a little more than half of patients were cured uh, with, with salvage therapy. Again, some of those baseline risk factors might affect someone's individual chance. Uh, the brentuximab-based salvage regimen seem pretty consistently in the 70 to 80% of patients are cured. Um, there's been two studies um, uh, more with, with more mature data. There's another third study um, that uh, has less mature data looking at immune therapy plus chemo. And the 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 rates of at least people who are in remission more than a year after the transplant are very high. Now, the, these are more recent studies, so they don't have the you know, uh, two, three, four years of follow-up yet, but they seem very promising. And at least, especially in the case of the pembrolizumab plus GND is an outpatient regimen, uh, so much much more convenient than some of these other regimens that may require hospitalization. Um, so it's, it's too early to say 
that you know, 90 plus percent of people may be cured with these regimens, but it's very promising so far. Um, and the data looks very, very good. And so I think, especially for patients who've had prior bruntuximab, these, uh, these immune therapy or what we call checkpoint inhibitor-based therapies, are really good in the second line setting. And so there's this question of uh, maintenance therapy. Uh, so this is approved, uh, you know, this, uh, the brontuximab is approved for maintenance therapy, uh, up to 16 doses every three weeks after transplant. And there's a lot of caveats with this study. So it's, this was um, a, a very well-run study in terms of randomization, uh, placebo, um, and did show a benefit to maintenance. But there are a few things that may make it harder to apply to current patients. And uh, one was that the, the PET-based imaging wasn't mandatory. So it, it's become clear that functional imaging uh, by PET is really needed to, to assess how well somebody has responded to second line therapy and is somebody uh, have a higher chance of success to second line therapy. Um, no prior brintuximab use was allowed. That made sense at the time uh, to really see what the benefit of the maintenance was. Uh, brintuximab wasn't approved in first line setting and it was really hard to get a second line. But so they said no prior brintuximab use was allowed. But nowadays, um, most people have had brintuximab uh, prior to the transplant at some point, whether they got it as primary therapy uh, or they got it as part of their second line therapy. So how well does maintenance work when somebody's already had it? I, th that question is unclear uh, at this time. And so really the role of maintenance in the patient's prior use is sort of undefined. And I, I think there's a variety of different practices in this setting. Certainly one doesn't wanna just give a drug uh, to significant toxicity in these patients. I noted the neurotoxicity or neuropathy um, uh, can be quite profound in these patients. So in general, if somebody qualified for maintenance by having an early relapse or a high-risk relapse in, uh, outside of lymph nodes, um, one could consider giving it up until the point of some sort of toxicity, but certainly I think causing significant uh, morbidity uh, in the maintenance setting, especially in somebody who's had prior brontuximab, is probably not called for in this era. So those are the patients who can potentially be cured with uh, with a transplant and the salvage chemotherapy. So what do we think about transplant ineligible or relapse after transplant? So there are some studies to help guide us about where to go. And so this is one study that led to the second line approval for pembrolizumab in transplant ineligible patients. Um, so pembrolizumab was given to relapse patients. Uh, uh, pembrolizumab, sorry, pembrolizumab versus brentuximab was randomized. And patients stayed progression-free or without their cancer growing longer when they were given immune therapy than when they were given brentuximab. And so it's about approximately five months longer in this setting. And so um, that, that data is pretty good. And yet the thing is, in nowadays, most patients have had brentuximab prior to you know, getting to this setting. Uh, but certainly if somebody you know, has not had any of these therapies and trying to decide do we use one or the other on its own? Maybe in an older patient or a transplant eligible patient, it's reasonable to do the immune therapy first, at least based on this data. So then there's this question, you know, can relapse patients be cured uh, without a transplant? And I think this is certainly an area of controversy. Uh, I, I think there are certainly limitations with the tools that we have to define uh, success or failure in this setting. Uh, but I can go through some of the data that we see just kind of help define where we are and uh, how one might define success in the setting. So this is the seminal study or the, the, the pivotal study, sorry, that looked at um, brentuximab vidotin in the relapse settings. So this led to its initial approval back in um, 2011. And when they looked at patients, it's a very potent drug, but it doesn't last forever in the vast majority of patients. Uh, almost everybody it will eventually grow again. But in some proportion of patients who achieved a complete remission, it seems to be able to last. So there was actually nine out of 100 patients had a sustained complete remission without additional therapy. And there, a lot of the patients who did have a good response, some of them did end up going to a transplant or to an allogeneic transplant or a transplant from another donor. So they weren't included in this, but there were patients for, some patients for a variety of reasons, more than five years out, did not have any additional therapy, and were still in a sustained complete remission off treatment. And so... Um, this suggests that perhaps a small percentage of patients may be cured in this setting, but I, it's not something I certainly set expectation wise with a patient that, Hey, you know, you're going to be in the small percentage of people. I generally consider in the setting that, uh, if somebody's ineligible for a transplant, uh, 
or relapse after a transplant, that the goal of the treatment is to keep it under control for as long a period of time. And certainly if somebody has an exceptional response, that's fantastic. And we, you know, we make the most of it, but um, it's, it's hard to set an expectation that somebody can be cured. Um, it, with these PD-1 inhibitors, immune therapy, um, you know, I, I sort of showed that you know, in the slide before that after about 30, you know, half of patients will progress after a little over a year. Um, but it's very different with this immune therapy. And I, I think the the way to think about it is immune therapy changes the natural history of um, Hodgkin lymphoma. And so this graph um, was presented a few years ago at ASH. And so despite the fact that most people's cancer will grow within a year or so, very few people die in the setting. So this tells us that the traditional measures of how do we define success and failure may not uh, handle this very well. So somebody may have significant reduction in their disease. Maybe they have a new lymph node pop up, counts as a progression. But if it's popping up and not growing significantly, they can remain on the immune therapy for a pretty long time and keep it under control. So I think the, the challenge here is that um, patients, in essence, treats the, it, it turns into like a chronic disease. And these drugs are amazing in, in a way that um, they can essentially keep people functional and well, and the cancer in essence kind of dormant. It may occasionally grow a little bit in various places, but uh, it really kind of turns into a chronic disease. Patients aren't losing their hair. Uh, and if they don't have significant autoimmune side effects, which most patients don't, uh, you never know that they're getting this kind of treatment. But the challenge here is many of these patients are young and having an incurable cancer in a young age requiring chronic palliative therapy uh, can be tough on, on young patients who uh, are trying to develop relationships. They may have kids and jobs and trying to think about careers. And it's hard to think beyond you know, the next six to 12 months in this setting because there's a lot of unknowns. These drugs were only approved around 2016. And so how long can this standard control in a young patient, we just don't know yet in a, in a time frame that's meaningful to younger patients. So for now, your patients can be stable on this for a while. And I think many are satisfied with that, but certainly the, the long-term outlook is just unclear because we don't know how long patients can, this can stay a chronic disease for the majority of patients. Um, in the pre-immune therapy era, most patients would succumb to the disease within six to 12 months with chemotherapy. And, um, this has allowed a lot of people to defer or delay what we call an allogeneic transplant. So that's a transplant from a different donor. Those can be very toxic um, and patients can die of complications related to the transplant itself. And it still doesn't cure the majority of patients in that setting. And so uh, many patients are okay kicking the can down the road and taking their immune therapy every four to six weeks and keeping their disease stable and under control. But um, probably the majority of patients with immune therapy aren't cured. If you stop the treatment, eventually it will start growing again. So some patients do need a break and just, you know, from a mental health standpoint, but ultimately they usually have to go back on it. And so um, in terms of future challenges uh, and relapse Hodgkin lymphoma, um, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. It's really balancing efficacy and toxicity. And, uh, you know, these historical regimens are very toxic, uh, but very effective. And I, it seems that since that era of those very toxic treatments, a lot of the research has really been focused on, can some people be cured with less? And I think uh, that could be less in terms of uh, less toxic drugs, shorter treatments, um, and, but there, there's challenges in this setting. So there's limitations to PET scans. Uh, PET scans are not perfect. Um, there can be false positives, particularly with immune therapy. There can also be false negatives. Uh, so patients can have false sense of uh, reassurance. Um, and then successes, a lot of these standard treatments are, are very successful. And so it can be very hard to enroll patients on clinical trials when the standard arm is very successful, and especially if the experimental arm involves some sort of de-escalation. And so a lot of what's going on now is just figuring out how to sequence novel agents and um, and you know, and how to address that unmet need unmet need. And so what is that unmet need now? And so you know just just looking at the numbers, uh, depending on how one looks at it and slices it, you know if eighty up to eighty five percent of people across all stages are cured with primary therapy, 
and 70% of the rest are cured with second line treatments and transplant, then it's probably about 5% of patients diagnosed who are not going to be cured with the current standards. And so um, it's a smaller and smaller slice of the pie, but meaningful to the people who are here because uh, most specialists like myself who treat enough lymphomas are starting to accumulate patients who are in essence on chronic palliative treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma, and they may be very, very young. And um, so it just sort of leads to sort of what's next, right? So that we, I've sort of noted that um, there can be success in curative treatment for the, the vast majority of patients, especially integrating these novel agents. But there is still an unmet need uh, among patients who relapse after transplant or patients who are on chronic immune therapy. So there's been some work to try to improve upon this. And um, there is a combination treatment uh, called um, uh, favazelamab, which is uh, another what we call checkpoint inhibitor. So another protein that's involved in tamping down the immune system uh, um, in the setting can, can be blocked and so sort of help enhance immune system or sort of slowing down immune cells um, and so help get them revved back up again. And that can be combined with the approved drug pembrolizumab. And so this has been tested in both naive immune therapy patients, as well as those who've had disease that's refractory, where the, the, the immune therapy doesn't work. And it does seem, at least in a small proportion of patients, uh, able to um, shrink the cancer again, even when the standard treatments didn't work. And uh, at least 79% um, you know, of patients had some reduction. So it may reinduce responses to immune therapy. And this drug is actually being tested in a randomized phase three study against chemotherapy in patients who don't have standard treatment options. Um, another um, uh, treatment that's out there is uh, uh, affectionately referred to as shorter down CAMET or camidanlimab tezzerine. Uh, so CAMET is a CD25 antibody drug conjugate. So just another sort of Trojan horse style drug. Uh, but the toxin is a little bit different. And uh, so it's not this microtubule toxin. And it does have some... Um, uncommon, but um, real neurologic uh, side effects, as well as skin and nail reactions that have limited longer term use in some of these early studies. So very potent drugs, similar to brentuximab, uh, but about 7% of patients in these earlier studies can get a rare neurologic condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can lead to neurologic weakness in some patients that may not resolve even with standard treatments. And so this is being studied ongoing. Uh, it, it's, it, I don't think it's close to FDA approval yet that the accruals to the study are ongoing. At least the initial data is, is similar to brentuximab where it's very potent. So most people will have some disease shrinkage, but it doesn't seem to be durable, meaning in most patients, it will start growing again uh, eventually. So uh, this if you know some of the safety can at least be codified and you know, patients can be advised with the potential risk if this is approved can be an option but certainly this isn't this doesn't look like it's going to be a home run cure for patients who don't have standard treatments and then actually this this is a very very small study that was presented and it's ongoing in Europe as presented at one of the European meetings uh, this summer um, and this uses a concept called abscopal radiation. So in essence, this is a way to en enhance uh, immune therapy. So somebody's on checkpoint inhibitor immune therapy, like pembrolizumab or nivolumab, and radiation can kind of be used to enhance the immune response by killing some cancer cells and perhaps uh, helping expose some of those cancer proteins to the immune cells to enhance responses elsewhere. So in essence, it means radiating one spot of the body and looking to see if that can shrink cancer in a different part of the body. Uh, so can it just enhance your immune response somewhere else? And a over half of patients had uh, reduction in their tumors outside of the radiation field, which is pretty remarkable. And it, I've, I've been doing this occasionally for patients or I've, you know, I've noted with immune therapy, there might be one lymph node that grows and everything else stays small and I radiate that site. And you know, I've, I think me and some of my colleagues have anecdotally seen that this works. And we have a radiation oncology here in a radiation oncologist here in Seattle who, you know, we occasionally do this for patients outside of a clinical trial, but it's good to see in a rigorous way that this can potentially work um, to enhance these immune responses. So what about CAR T cell therapy? So of course, this is all the rage uh, in uh, in those uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients who have CD19, so there's CD19 approved CAR T cell therapies for 
a variety of types of lymphomas. Uh, and I do get asked this a lot for Hodgkin lymphoma, but one of the limitations is the target. So CD19 is the CAR T cell, uh, the target for CAR T cells that are approved. That's not present on the Hodgkin cell, but this, the, the protein that is uniformly uh, expressed on uh, on the Hodgkin cell is CD30. Um, there is some limited uh, phase one data from CD30 directed CAR T cell therapy. Um, so just to kind of just briefly go through it, if, if one hasn't seen any of the other sessions, CAR T cell therapy is in essence a way to program your immune cells or T cells uh, to fight cancer. So um, blood uh, is collected through an apheresis machine and T cells are taken out. Uh, and then there's a manufacturing process by which uh, a gene is inserted that allows this T cell to have what we call a chimeric antigen receptor towards a specific target. And so that can be grown and expanded. And then there's a conditioning chemotherapy in essence to kind of clear the way for this immune cell. So it's one of the only T cells floating around so it has space to grow. And so it gets reinfused, expanded in the body. And after a month, uh, you know, managing various side effects, we hope that it's found every single last cancer cell and, and killed it. And so that, that one treatment can be enough to kill every single last cancer cell. But for now, there's sort of limited durability and safety data. It, I don't think it's not close to an FDA approval uh, yet, but certainly this is something that's being investigated. Uh, and you know, over the coming years, we may learn more information about whether this may become a potential option for relapse Hodgkin patients. This is a graph that I was just alluding to earlier in terms of you know, who's cured by primary therapy. So the blue chunk, the biggest piece of the pie are cured with their primary therapy. So that's, what was, uh, that's what's being discussed in the untreated Hodgkin lymphoma session. And you can see a lot of those uh, great successful treatments there. Uh, orange ones are patients who are cured with an auto transplant. So those are the ones who get some sort of more intensive second treatment, get the high dose chemo, confusion of stem cells, rescue, those orange in there. Uh, and that orange may continue to grow depending on how well we verify the success of some of these new checkpoint inhibitor-based chemo regimens. And then there's the patients who are in gray. So these are patients who are ineligible for transplant or those who relapse post-transplant. So those are the patients who these days um, generally get immune therapy chronically uh, and may occasionally get brontuximab again or radiation. These are the ones who should be considered for clinical trials if eligible. Um, and you know, my hope is that you know this slice gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and I think from a patient advocacy and research standpoint, the thing that I worry about, and I think the thing that those uh, who don't worry work in pharmaceutical companies should worry about is as that slice gets smaller, will the interest in in trying to improve beyond this um, go away? And um, I think that's why people certainly need to be continued continue to have interest in relapse Hodgkin lymphoma. I don't think it's satisfactory to I, I don't think it's acceptable to have that long term and not continue to try to, uh, improve upon this. So having people on chronic treatment from their 20s and 30s, and who knows how long that works. Uh, it's great that we have that, but that should be buying us time to have improved therapies for this in this setting. And that may improve some of those frontline therapies as well. Um, and so um, we'll see for now, there's a couple things that are in the pipeline, but you know, I, I think from an advocacy standpoint, it's important to, to be loud and make sure that there's continued interest in research and development of new therapeutics in this setting. And um, with that, you know, of course, I want to thank um, my clinical team and research staff and all my mentors and colleagues. And uh, of course, patients like those who are at this meeting and of course, with my, my patients in clinic as well. Uh, and the, the numerous patients who have participated in clinical trials in over the decades, the, the types of improvements and advances that have occurred in that time frame would never be possible without clinical trial participations.